Okay, to go. All right, good afternoon and thank you very much for inviting us and uh, it's a pleasure to be able to come here today um, from see from Wrexham, myself and Ben from Cardiff to give you a, a bit of an overview of the Barmer Viaduct uh, project that we undertook um, over the last four years. But predominantly today we're going to talk about the steel structure that was renewed last year. Um, so hopefully uh, the agenda or the order of the running will be some introductions, which I'll go on to the project overview, the challenges and solutions that we uh, that uh, we faced and encountered and overcame, uh, the methodology, including um, an animation, and we'll end with a, a, a video uh, which we can play out. And then, you know, the floor is open to ask any questions for Steve, engineering, Ben, and I for the project management. Any questions you've got um, after? So to introduce us. It is common. Is it? Okay. So there's three mug shots there. So uh, I'm Simon Roberts. I'm the program manager for Network Rail. Uh, I was the client's representative for this uh, part of the uh, the works. Um, you want to stand up and introduce yourself, Ben? Save me. Yeah, uh, Ben Perkins. I'm the lead portfolio manager for Network Rail. So I was working under Simon at the time. I was the scheme project manager uh, for the Barmouth job. Yeah, I'm uh, Steve Richardson. I was the uh, operations manager and I also acted as the engineering manager for the scheme. So it's going to be a bit of a, a three way effort here. Uh, I'm going to pass over to Ben now um, to hopefully to talk yeah. a little bit about the overview, a bit of the history of the structure. Uh, then we'll run through, as I said, the agenda. And again, at the end, we'll, we'll be here to you know, finish off the buffet or have a coffee and have a discussion about anything anybody wants to uh, to have a chat about. Is it coming? It is. It's a bit of a lag. It's a heck of a lag. OK, so over to Ben. Thank you very much. Sorry, Ben. Uh, can we just ask uh, Gareth if he can turn his camera off? Sorry, he's uh, going to be online and on recording. So that's a brief history on Barmouth. Um, so it was opened in 1867, uh, designed by uh, Henry Connabier and Benjamin Piercy, uh, as you can see from the picture um, below. So initially, the northern end uh, included a drawbridge or a swing bridge that allowed the passage of tall ships into the uh, Maldach estuary. Um, and this was rebuilt into uh, twin hogback spans um, and completed in 1902 by Cleveland Bridge of Darlington. Um, so it's an iconic structure. Um, it's one of the longest um, timber viaducts in the world, um, and it's Grade 2 star listed, uh, which posed a um, challenge in the design. Um, so the metallic section is actually made from two bridges. Um, so you've got Underbridge 42 and Underbridge 41, um, con consisting of two flat uh, approach spans here, and then on the two hog uh, back spans. So the, um, the final part of uh, 30 million pound investment, uh, this was to safeguard the future, the iconic uh, Grade 2 star listed structure. Uh, the metallic works followed on from the renewal of the uh, timber viaduct uh, in the previous phase. Um, so the reconstruction of metallic um, elements included the replacement of the existing hand railing uh, with a new handrail, um, and this was to match the, um, the, the original handrail of the previous structure. Um, <coughs> of one thing to note, so Cleveland Bridge, who installed the original structure in 1902, they were in fact uh, initially appointed to carry out uh, the fabrication and installation of the new structure, um, but unfortunately they went into administration uh, not long after contract award. Um, so the romantic story didn't quite um, come to fruition. Um, the contract was then um, awarded to Carver's engineering. Moving on the laptop. Yes, moving on. Yes, moving on to 15 seconds at the minute. Good. Mm. This is that. <laughs> it's not that. We've not had that before. Still with me a second. Um, it's actually moved on online. There you go. Yeah. 
Go ahead. Okay. Again then. But I'm just going to do a screen share on the window share. That might. Very slow, isn't it? Okay. Um, so just briefly looking at the scope, as you can see from the photos beneath, there was severe uh, corrosion and section loss um, to both um, Underbridge 42 and Underbridge 41. Um, and the scope then was divided into superstructure replacement and um, also repair the substructure elements involving uh, grip, blast and painting. Um, so the, the, the project was a heritage scheme, um, so it required full listed building consent. So as a result, um, there increased level of stake stakeholder engagement uh, throughout the design phase, um, and that was to ensure like for like uh, replacement was achieved um, during the works using modern uh, en engineering techniques. Um, a, a sort of a good example of this is the fact that um, uh, in order to imitate the original uh, structure, we installed uh, circa three thousand imitation rivets. Um, along the top flanges of all the main beams and also the new handrail um, to honour the original structure itself. I'll now pass over to Steve, who's going to talk about some of the challenges. Can we press that one, yeah? Yeah. That's probably in there. <coughs> oh, that's much better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's... Uh... Got that? Excellent. Right, so um, there were a whole range of uh, challenges, situations, challenges um, with regards to the, uh, to the to the structure. Um, kind of run through um, you know, from a from a design, from a planning, from an implementation phase. Um, we take it right back to the beginning. Um, one of the main challenges was simply its location. Um, you know, it sits in a tidal estuary. You've got uh, up to five meter tidal range, up to nine knots um, uh, speed of current. At times, parts of the bridge are completely dried out. So somewhere near um, the fixed span, which is the southern end, could be, dry, could be completely dried out. Whereas at the same time, the navigation span, which is basically the, the end of the swing span towards the, uh, the flat approach ones, has still got eight metres of, uh, of water ranging all the way up to 13 metres of water. Um, we did consider various options right at the beginning. I was lucky enough to be part of the feasibility studies for, for this as well as the actual construction. Um, we considered a causeway. The entire area is triple SI, the topography of the area and the, the um the, the tourist town of Barmouth meant that we pretty quickly decided that a, a causeway would have been a very good idea. Um, we did consider barges. We'd have had to bring barges in from Holyhead, which is some 80 miles by sea. Uh, the work itself was going to be done in, in the autumn and the winter because of the tourist draw of the area. So bringing them that far by sea in that in that, um, that time of year was going to be very difficult to do. The tidal range that you've got to just use pontoons meant that that would have been a real problem with areas of it drying out and some, of our, some areas not. Um, we could have counted that with spud leg pontoons. Um, however, just to add a further complication to it, you've got a 33 kV cable, which is above ground at this location and then below the seabed, running 30 metres off the actual structure itself, which is pretty much exactly where we would have put spud leg uh, for the pontoon. So that wasn't really going to be uh, a particularly feasible idea. Um, there was also, which we picked up kind of later on, I think there was also concerns over the stability of some of the piers. Um, historical records being as they are, um, the, the condition of them and such like, there was concerns that if we took the stabilising um, influence of the actual bridge deck off it, that we might have had an issue with movement of those, so that we needed to develop a system that actually held the significant piers uh, in place. Pier 3, which is the centre of the swing span, is pretty much self-contained because it contains four piers, four cylinders, so that's generally OK, but the others less so. So the whole kind of the whole ethos was then to try and develop something that would keep these um, these things actually stable. Are you doing that or am I doing that? It's on the laptop. Yeah. yeah. Well, this okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So let's put that down. <laughs> My esteemed colleague will, uh, will assist on that one. So we looked at uh, looked at the situation that we had um, in order to to not have a, a large crane in the actual estuary itself, we then had to develop a system whereby we, we 
came away from that. Um, the solution ultimately was to drive the main hogback bridge sections in, sort of 40 metre sections in, down the track from Morpha, which is to the south of, um, of the structure, that's some half a mile away, um, thankfully on straight track, um, not necessarily the best of condition track, but certainly uh, that. From there, with some quite extensive temporary works, we would create an 85 metre long runway that we would then operate a gantry crane on. That gantry crane would then be used to do the demolition, cutting the, set, the bridge into sections that were 23 tonnes uh, apiece, uh, and ultimately then also to bring in the uh, the new deck panels, because obviously the, the main the main beams would have already been there. Uh, bridge 42, which is the, the flat, sections that you see here, which are the two northern approach spans, um, in order to get around the, the potential peer instability issues. That was a propping system that we uh, we developed um, that was designed by TGP, supplied by Maybe Higher, uh, and that, that ensured that they weren't moved. We actually incorporated the permanent rock anchors that we put into the abutment, to the north abutment, as part of that system for, for that restraint. Um, the reconstruction of the, the bridge 42 was a little bit more traditional. So it was craneage, crane out, crane in. Again, with this bridge, nothing is quite that simple. The biggest crane we could get there is a TXM 44 ton rail crane. Um, positioning that on the, on the structure, not the easiest of things to do, but I'll, I'll explain that as we go. Um, one thing I would say, there's an awful lot of temporary works within, within this. There's over 50 significant temporary works. I don't mean hoarding, I don't mean Harris fence panelling, I don't mean minor bits of tower scaffolds or anything like that, I mean 50 significant bits of temporary works that we, we uh, did. Um, we will literally, I will talk about a handful of those here today. If I was to talk about the rest of them, then you'd be looking at three or four presentations. I was thinking to myself when you said you've got a vacancy next week, I could, I could probably fill it with, with, with just some more of the temporary works on that. So um, I'll start with um, how we actually got it there. I hope. Yes, there we go. So the plan was basically, like I said, to drive the uh, the two main spans, what we, the fixed span and the swing span. So these are the 40 metre hug, hug back uh, spans down the track from Morpha to the structure. That's a half a mile of track. Um, thankfully, the vast majority of that was over the timber bridge. Uh, and we had, re had renewed the timber bridge um, a couple of years earlier, so it was all brand new track over the uh, over the timber structure, which was good. Uh, not so good was that the um, the track between the compound and the uh, the bridge itself hadn't been renewed. It was actually down to be renewed in between those two at them, but for whatever reason, it didn't get done. Um, so one of the things that we uh, we did there is we did a full survey of the full extent that we were going to do three meter intervals. Uh, we used a 40 metre verse sign on that because we bought a basically a 40 metre fixed length bridge with six trailers underneath it um, and the bridge wasn't going to move. The, the connection between the two was relatively static, which meant that we did have a, a genuine derailment uh, concern. Uh, we did establish that there was areas where we were going to get something like 22 mil difference from a verse sign point of view, which would have caused us a problem with the initial setup. Um, the, the actual system itself, you've got a series of trailers, then you've got temporary work sitting on the trailers, and then you've got a jacking system. So you had 20 20-ton 20 jacks that basically held this configuration in place. And this configuration consisted of the two main girders and then a temporary maybe truss within the middle. What we did once we'd done the, um, the, the survey, and then we also did a trial within the compound itself. So we had a 92 and a half meter length of uh, temporary track that we installed. Um, we actually basically used the track that we'd taken off the timber viaduct the year, the year or so before to create our, our track. Um, I think I put in my I think I put in my own notes that we'd actually purposely put in a defect in that in that 92 meters to mimic what we had out there. It's entirely true. We did put the defect in. It wasn't necessarily on purpose, but uh, it, it did it did prove a point, which was good. Uh, and what we did was uh, the jacking system itself had a, a certain tolerance on the head of the jack. Um, and we increased that tolerance somewhat to make sure that the, the issues of the verse and the issues of the track weren't, weren't going to be uh, so much of a problem. Um, we had six trailers in total, two 20 ton trailers, which are 10 a penny, you get 20 ton trailers pretty much anywhere you want every weekend. It's fantastic. 
four 40 ton trailers. There were only four 40 ton trailers in the entire UK. We had all of them all at the same time. Curiously, one of them was out of test, out of uh, engineering certificates. We had to also get that sorted out and get that uh, get that in there. One of the big issues that we did have with it, as you imagine driving 200 ton of bridge down the track, sitting on these six trailers, um, all being pushed into place by a, a Unimog. Unimog is more than capable of pushing all of that. It could push three times that. But what it can't do is stop when I tell it to stop. Um, you know, we did practice it on the on the trial run, and we already had a solution in place, but we did just for just for fun try it. And I remember personally doing it, saying, right, stop now. Two feet later is where we stop. Now, if we'd have done that on out on the bridge, especially when the second span comes in, we'd have had a bit of a 200 ton collision problem. And um, so what we did is we developed a towing mechanism. Basically, we attached a, um, a hollow ram jack to the track, used the track itself on the bridge as an anchor uh, with a, a purpose-built tow bar. And we literally pulled it, pulled the entire train, including the Unimog, the last couple of hundred mil, uh, to basically place it exactly where we needed it to be. That took care of the longitudinal issue. Laterally, as we were as we were bringing this, this down, there's obviously a fair bit of movement. You've got tolerances within the track itself, but we need to put it down at a quite a precise location. So when it sat down on temporary stools, which are connected to temporary beams that sit underneath on the piers itself, we had quite simply a wedge arrangement. And as the bridge dropped down, it literally just pushed it into the position it needed to be. We then released all of the jacks and then we simply drive it out uh, from underneath. And that's how we got around that particular issue in terms of where we put the uh, bridge. So the series of animations, we, we had a full animation uh, for this for the tender. We also use its planning, briefing and public consultations. And what we've done is we've just extracted certain elements of it just to show yourselves. It, because to be honest with you, it does get a little bit boring. Um, so it's easy for me to explain and then show you uh, what it is. So that was the two, that was the plan for the two um, elements to come down. Right. Um, so I mentioned previously that we, we basically split the bridge into, into, into the two sections. So you've got Underbridge 41, which is the, the hogback, and Underbridge 42. So the demolition of the Underbridge 40, 41, the hogback um, beams. So with the, uh, with the new um, bridge in place with its temporary works and the uh, and the 85 metre long runway. We installed the uh, the gappies on these. These these were approximately 10 ton. They've got a 40 ton capacity, so it's four um, 10 ton hoists, all uh, remotely operated, so that the, the individual could actually be down on our walkway down here. Could even be down here at times, simply operating them in terms of um, in terms of doing that. Just as a, an aside. The two, um, two gantries were actually named. We named them Henry and Benjamin um, after the original uh, designers of the bridge, just so we could give them a reference instead of it just simply being north and south of one and two. Um, so we split this, the structure, each span in, the, in seven, approximately 23 ton sections. Each one of these sections was held in place using McAloy bars and um, what we deemed to be lifting beams, which I never understand why we call them that because they weren't lifting, but still support beams that were underneath the, uh, the, the runway. That would hold each individual section in place that allowed the demolition crew to literally completely cut it up. So every single one of those cuts, we just did one cut, moved on to the next one, did the next one and continued on. And whilst they continued on doing that, as soon as we were ready with the, um, with the gantry, we would, we would pick up a section as that would be started on number six because it was a straight drop. Pick up a section so that it is definitely taking the weight. And the, the advantage there is that the first time that the gantry sees the weight, there's no shock loading to it. It literally picks it up, right? I've got all of it. If there was any issues, it's still being held by the McAloy bars. We would then loosen off the McAloy bars. The beams, as they extended above the actual structure, um, then had to be rotated out of the way. So we created a hinge mechanism that we could just simply pull those out of the way. Pull those out of the way and then literally drop them down onto a weight in pontoons. Those pontoons then went across to Barmouth itself as a beach just past the harbour. 
they would be taken into there at high tide, generally high tide slack, because again, with the current running so quickly, you, you simply couldn't do it at uh, any stage of tide other than slack tide and slack water, for those who don't know, is basically as the tide is about to turn, it just stops. And that's that's the time, which gives us about an hour per per tide that we can actually um, move move these elements about to. And it would sit on the beach, that would dry out, we then take an excavator, basically use a set of shears rather than burning equipment, because obviously we're right on the beach, right next to Barmouth itself, to cut that up. Of particular note, and it's in the video later on, is the ring beam. So inside of here, you've actually got the original mechanism that turned the uh, the swing span back in the day to allow the uh, the total chip ships to come through. Um, when we actually lifted that up, the gap that we had between the ring beam, the top of the cowling here, and the underside of the new bridge was a total of 40 millimetres. So we had a 20 mil gap above and a 20 mil gap below. Um, and there's quite a significant bit in the video that you can see that. And it, it was certainly, I, I was stood on here when it was going out and I was, yeah, clenching a little bit whilst that was going on, but it, uh, it worked. It worked very well, thankfully. Um, one thing that if I haven't mentioned it is obviously in order to bring this in, this is actually narrower than the final version because obviously you can't, it can't, it, it eventually will sit there. So it's, it, it's brought in for the demolition. Um, in that narrow, I won't call it narrow gauge because it's not, but in that narrow arrangement. And I'll explain what we did to that a little bit later on. It is coming. Yes, there we go. So, Underbridge 42, it, it, it's quite funny. We had various conversations at the time where Underbridge 42 was almost an aside to everything that was going on and yet within its own right in any other situation would be a very big scheme uh, and a very complicated scheme so it, it, relatively straightforward in terms of in terms of what we did we basically sat the uh the TXM monster crane on uh what is span two just the way that it works um lifted out the cross girders individually then we lifted out the main girders and set back um, typically with Barmouth, nothing's quite as straightforward as, you, as you'd like it to be. Um, the, the bridge deck consisted of troughs, so rail barrier troughs with uh, longitudinal timbers, short section longitudinal timbers in between the main girders, the cross girders, sorry. Um, and underneath there was, it was simply two angles holding it up. When we put this dance floor in underneath, the scaffold access underneath, and inspected those angles, several of those angles had just rotted away to next to nothing, uh, to the point that we were genuinely concerned. They were they were meant to have, I think, RA7 rating. Uh, the, the whole structure has an RA5 rating. Uh, we only needed RA5 to actually operate the TXM crane, but these were in such poor condition that we couldn't do that. So in order to actually do the physical work, we had to put series of ladder beams using the maybe higher equipment underneath them to support them temporarily, very short term temporarily in order to, to do the lifting out. Um, the other problem that we have with TXM is its reach. Um, it's got a 14 and a half meter reach. And by the time it was sat on the abutment, it couldn't actually physically reach pier one. So in order to get around that, because there's a cross head here that has to be replaced, we actually, as we demolished it, so just shortly after this stage, after we demolished span one, we actually put the new beam sat on gallows brackets on the pier itself, continued the, the build, the, the demolition. We moved the, the old one by again on gallows brackets towards it by just simply sliding it towards it, picked it up, took it away. And then once the plinths were ready, we actually then just slid the new beam into position onto um, the top of the piers. So he dropped it there, never got touched by a crane again, and then just got slid into its final position. And then eventually we would rebuild back um, towards the towards the uh, underbridge for one. Well, see there, that, that's the, the angles and such like. Uh, <coughs> go for the next one. Which I think is the animation yeah. of the same. Good, so I can stop talking for a second. Underneath here, 
this the, the main beams, the new main beams are supported on temporary beams that sit on top of the cylinders there, with stools that basically push through the deck. And the gantries could obviously not only just go lift up and down, they could lift up and move forwards and backwards as well. Might be in the middle. Right. So, probably one of the most significant bits, but um, generally, um, yeah, not really uh, quite a, an obvious thing, was actually the sliding of the beams. So, obviously, once we've done the demolition, everything's out of the way. We actually jacked it down to pretty much its final location. So, it's now still sitting on temporary beams underneath but it's still not in the right position in so much as that it's it's a narrow narrow position in terms of where it is this is annoying mm. why is that not working a click so i'm working is it working there mm. might end up with the next one so yeah so yeah so what we had is you've got the uh the the central truss, which is the, the maybe truss in there, and then you had eight 20 ton uh, push pull props. So, that basically, once you move it, it holds it in both directions. Um, the remaining beam and uh, and truss would act as the resistance for that. Um, it would be the, the arrangement here was a stainless steel plate with PTFE pads, and basically, we just pushed that 45 ton beam. I keep on saying approximately 963 mil. I'm just sad because I remember these things, but <laughs> generally 963 mil into its final position. Once that was uh, in that position, we then locked that off and then pushed the other one. Of note, all of the beams that go across from one beam to the other, which are generally supporting beams, some of them would, that were used as part of the demolition, uh, were either designed to be removed prior to the, uh, to the actual move or were designed to actually move out with it so they would telescope out with it and be reattached the gantries themselves were actually designed specifically to allow that movement to happen so literally and you'll see it on a video when we actually push it out the gantry just moves out with it it just simply sit sat there the entire time our original concept was going to be to take the gantries off do the move put the gantries back on once we modified them but through the design process, we managed to actually change that so that they actually moved with it, which was a, which is a real um, saving of time. It's really annoying that that's not working because uh, here you've actually got a time lapse of that of that beam being moved across. Um, not sure why it's not working, but uh, I don't know whether it's working online or whether it's just here. I'm not playing media. That might be slightly concerning for the for later on. Yeah. Yeah. Not playing. Again? Not playing. Not playing. That's fine. That's fine. It is what it is. But ultimately, what you see is that bridge, that, that beam there getting moved across. Um, and that. And these are the jacks that, uh, that we used to do that. And so, very simple jacks. Uh, capacity wise, they didn't need to be anywhere near that size. Their actual capacity was more about holding it in place because that beam was just sat there completely free, then with only these things holding it until everything else was reconnected. Yeah, it has is several seconds slower than online. It's already there. It's already there. It's in the room. Excellent. 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 There we go. There we go. One of the one of the things I, I probably haven't explained particularly well with regards to this bridge. This bridge is relatively unique. Most bridges you have main 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 girders and cross girders. Cross girders tend to sit on top of the bottom flange. Um, with this bridge, and because it's listed, it has to go back looking the same, which is advantageous to us. The actual cross girders sit up underneath the bottom flange and have bolted to the bottom flange. So all of the capacities in the bolts quite a few years ago, Network Rail um, had Griffiths, as it happens, uh, change a lot of the existing rivets to bolts because there was genuine concern for rivets here for, the, for those rivets. And then those sections where it just fell clear off. So that, that was an advantage for us and it helped us with uh, the method that we chose and so much as you could just lift these things straight up. Piers one and two, 
which is a very brief history. Piers 1 and 2 are the original piers from 1867. So when it got reconstructed, they they were left in place, but they reconstructed uh, these brand new the timbers previously. These were aligned to match the cross, the, the main girders, whereas they, they changed the alignment and these don't match the actual main girders. And as a result, this is why this crosshead beams are in there and it's to basically take it, the load from the cross girders back into the cylinders because they're offset. So these cross girders, these crosshead beams have to be replaced. In order to replace these beams underneath the uh, this new structure that we've built and put in, we have to come up with something relatively unique in terms of what we did. So we created this cantilever system. So basically we tied the two structures together above pier four here. We had the, the permanent works in there. So there's a, there's a H frame that goes in there that replaces what was the, uh, the ring beam. And then you've got uh, basically the central cross girder, which is the long bearer as, as is. And then we jacked up off that. So you've got the two tied together here. We jacked up off there until we then created an air gap there. And that, that was 20 or 30 mil. That then, once it was all locked off, allowed the gantry to come across, pick up. So you've got approximately 10 tonne of gantry, picking up eight tonne worth of um, steel from underneath, taking it out from here, back down into a pontoon, putting the new one in, and then putting the first panel in, which included the bearings as well. And then it would be set back down onto that. Um, in order to, for us to continue installing the panels. If you just click again, hopefully it just stays yeah. where I want it to. Yeah. Not quite the same situation on PA4 and PA5 in so much as the PA4 and PA5. Again, you've got that end panel, which doubles up as the bearing arrangement. So here at the beginning, if we're, we're sitting on these temporary beams that we've put in with the extensions and the slide, um, sliding arrangement, so what we then did is we, because we were, these two are bolted together, we jacked underneath one of them. And again, it was designed specifically so we could incorporate a jack into it. So we jacked that up so that the load path was coming through here. That allowed this to be lifted using the gantry, taken out down onto a pontoon, back up again with the new section. And then what we what we did then is obviously as as all new bridges are, you've got the means to change the bearings in the future. So you've got the jacking locations for the bearings. So we then just use that jacking location to jack up this side. So the load path then came down here, allowing this to be a gap and we changed it that way. On the far end where you hit uh, P of five, you don't have quite the same arrangement but because of the way that it sits on the, on the top of the P, there's enough room behind it to put a strut. So we put a strut right to the underside of the beam and basically picked up the entire bridge deck end, drove back across it with the uh, the gantry, did the same again, took out the temporary works, put the permanent works in. And from there, relatively straightforward in so much as then we just simply lift the panels up into place, which see if that works. <laughs> I'm slightly concerned that some of this might not work, which would be really interesting. Mm. Looks good. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, so what you've got there then is just lifting the panels up. Um, the panels came complete with uh, the Viper base plates put on them and with a uh, slave rail in them so that once they were all in place, we had a running railway to take to aid us taking the temporary works out. So we had a uh, rail bone plant that we could use on there. And where necessary, it actually came with the scaffolding already suspended underneath it. The main reason for that is that there's an awful lot of bolts. Each panel had around about 200 bolts to connect it to its, to the main beams and to its neighbour. So with the uh, the scaffolding already there, very quick adaptation by the scaffolders that were permanently on site, and then we had instant access to the underside of it to to do that full bolting up arrangement, and eventually to paint those those same joints. Um, and then once that was done, we simply tip run through it. With, um, with again the TXM crane to change the slave rail into circus 60 foot rails to not quite because of the way that it turns out, and then also the guard rail. So, you'll be pleased to know that I'm going to stop talking in a minute. Um, so, just to introduce the video. So, what you've got from the video is it starts with us fabricating or bringing together the, the three elements of each one of the beams on site. 
at the um, at the trial slab that we use then to do the testing. And just as a, as a point of note, although you don't really see it here, the trial slab that we did, that we built with the track on it, not only did we use that to actually physically test to see that it would work and we could drive it to the bridge, we also used it to prove that pushing the beam out by the 963 mil would work. We also used it to prove that the cantilever system would work. And we, we, we found that when we did the cantilever jacking system, the first 20 or 30 mil simply took the sag out the beam and nothing happened. So that mean that meant that we actually adapted the jacking arrangement for when we actually got out there. So it was, it was a very valuable thing that we did um, to prove that. And also we used it to prove that we could pull it in that final, that final section to make sure that we could get it into the right place. Um, you'll see that the, uh, the driving of the, the structure the system to the structure on the actual track uh, of, of note, we had all of this complicated stuff that we did in order to make sure that it drove down the track and didn't fall over. We had a spirit level right in the middle of the entire system. Uh, and rather than trying to stop every now and again and try to get into there to have a look at it, I brought my GoPro, set my GoPro up looking at the, at the spirit level and then just looked at it on my phone. So there's a, there's a scene in there where you'll see form with the spirit level. That was simply how we made sure it didn't fall over going down there. So we just monitored it as it went. As soon as she started to, the bubble started to move, we would pause, maybe would readjust all of the jacking system, make sure that it was straight again, and then off we go. We got it to the point where we didn't need to stop in the end, we just kept on going. Um, you'll see the demolition. And again, you'll notice that bit where the, the ring beam is coming out. Um, you'll see the sliding of the main beams. And again, these happen relatively quickly. So it was kind of, you see the cantilever, luckily the cantilever there for quite some time. Um, and you see from the photographs, it was, it, it's quite a photograph to see, especially from the sea where you've just simply got it sat. You know, it was about two and a half meters of, of fresh air from the pier head to the underside of the main beam at one point. Underbridge uh, 42 reconstruction is kind of happening whilst everything else is going on. So again, you'll see us drop that first beam on there and you'll see it get slid into place and then the rebuild. One of the significant bits about that, which I kind of probably brushed over, was the capacity of the crane was such that the main beams, it couldn't quite pick them up, the new ones going in. So what we actually did is we left off some of the diagonals in the middle of it dropped them in and then welded in those diagonals in situ uh, in order to be able to keep on going with that. So you'll see some welding going on and that's what that was for. Um, and, and then most importantly, from our point of view, uh, is the track going in at the end, which is relatively straightforward, he says. Yeah, yeah. And I'm hoping <laughs> that this actually works. That's not a good step. There we go. There's some dramatic music in the background as well. I don't know whether that's coming across. Okay. Interestingly, the people online apparently are seeing this much better than you are, which is, which is, which is definitely an unfortunate situation. Talking nicely. I know I could, couldn't I? Yeah. Uh, good. I think it's self explanatory. I'm hoping it's self explanatory. This is us testing the system to make sure that we can physically drive it. Um, and so this was us pushing it um, basically a lot within its length. So just over 40 meters. Is it a single track viaduct? Yes, it's a single track viaduct. Okay. A single track viaduct. Right. Okay. Yeah, I probably should have explained that at the beginning. Yes, yeah, a single track viaduct. And those, like I say, those timbers that you see underneath there were literally about 18 months earlier, the actual running timbers that were on the uh, timber viaduct. So in here, you've got these 20 jacks that basically keep it balanced. You see how tight that was going in. And it was very tight going in. There's my, my phone and the GoPro.
we, we actually took it down with all, a lot of the jacks and all, the lot, lots of the next phase is already in there. So the, the jacking arrangement at the end was actually already in place, ready to, to do that once we got to it. That's the, yeah. One of the gantries being loaded in whilst we were still bringing in the second span. Pontoons are supplied by um, Scaffold, so it's a combination of uh, plastic pontoon and scaffolding. Um, a really, really good system. So you don't have to be bringing it in by sea, so they literally built them on the beach and then we uh, use them for that. See, kind of literally go, go to the beach next to the uh, next to the Barmouth Harbour. So that's what that is up there. Hello? Hello? Video is a lot smoother for those who are watching it online, by the way. There's this is the ring beam. That's a 17 ton beam, seven and a half meter diameter. Uh, the underside of it had uh, purpose built cast sections. There's a, um, I don't know exactly how many sections there were. But you can see there, as you came out, the 20 mil top and bottom that I was talking about. And this is cast iron for the cowling. So if we'd have touched it, it would have done it an awful lot good. The council did consider keeping that, putting it somewhere until they realised how big it was. <laughs> <laughs> and then they said, thanks for the offer, but you won't bother. I did, I did. And you also declined it. I don't know why. I don't know why. Fit in the car. Yeah. <laughs> and again, you can see, you can see the, the demolition. And again, we simply just cut them up on the beach. So that's the demolition phase there. You can see the sections being dropped out. That's that beam. There you go. Classic Welsh weather there as well. Oh, yeah. The, 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 the slightly annoying thing is with, with the video is that the vast majority of the video is obviously it's sun shining because when we, we brought Mulholland Media in to, to do the drone footage and all the rest of it, it was obviously when it was going to be good weather. Um, it quite rightly planned that way. So the bits that you don't see is the 70 mile an hour wind, the, 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 the horizontal rain, um, which we had a fair bit of, to be honest with you. There's it been slid out. See the back one, and then you'll see it from the other angle in a moment. And then you can see there how that came in without all of the diagonals in it that were then welded, welded back in. So these are the new panels now coming in. So these particular panels are going over the top of Pier 1, not oh, Pier 3, sorry, which is why there's no scaffolding underneath these. The, uh, the slave rail. This is now the underslung scaffolding. So the, the scaffolding was designed to take the weight of the actual deck unit sitting on top of it while it was on the pontoon, and then it would it would basically be suspended from it once it was lifted up into place. That entire arrangement was about ten ton being lifted up by the gantries.
it's just starting to take the, uh, the temporary work. So we, we started taking it down um, because of the payway contract. We're booked in at a certain time. We stopped taking the temporary works down, put the track in, and then completed take, taking the temporary works down. Something probably didn't mention previously is once the, the, the actual bridge works were complete, Network Rail and Colas, then we placed um, 300 metres of track to the north of the bridge, so through the tunnel. We completed around the 24th, 25th of November, and then they, they completed on the 5th, 6th, 7th, with it track opening on the 8th. In with scaffolding on there, we just put a temporary hand railing up in order to then put the permanent hand railing up. A lot of the timber, it's a brand new timber walkway that we put on there and they come in um, pre-made with angles and, and majority of the timbers, and then just dropped in and then the, the, the ones above the cross is actually just put in, which is why you see a series of gaps there. Just a slight change of alignment as it comes under the timber structure for about the first six metres. This is the hand railing that Ben mentioned earlier. It's a complete change to the original hand railing, to the hand railing that was there because it was put in there some there sometime in the 80s. This is a bridge you can walk over, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. You can actually use a motorcycle over it. Yeah, you can actually. Yeah, you can go off that on a motorbike. And again, you can see that we then could clad the uh, the scaffolding for the underside of it, which allowed us to paint the underside where all of the spices have been and all of the bolts and such like. That was the first, not quite the first train, but basically the first day that it was open as well. Very kindly give us a bit of, bit of snow and to say to give it a piece of back, <laughs> backdrop. So, um, next one, and then just any questions to be put I'll something? just, I'll, I'll wrap up. I'll just, <clears throat> yep. Well, well, that's playing. So, yeah, yeah. it plays. <laughs> yeah. That's going to be really annoying. That's uh, that's the cab ride for the first train. I think Gareth online's actually shared the the link where you can look at that in real time, and it's got some quite funky '90s music to it. So, doesn't seem to be playing, unfortunately. Yeah. Right. Oh, well, that will be um, different to the others. But... Yeah, just thanks very much, Steve. Really appreciate that. And again, thanks everybody's time. I thought I just thought I'd end with a few statistics of. Uh, Obviously, to get us to this point, it was a three month closure that allowed us to do another bridge at Dovey, um, which was a, a 10 million pound job, a timber and metallic structure, a bit of a mini Barmouth, really. So we undertook that at the same time, as well as some retaining wall work. So we maximised that possession. A lot of other uh, network rail projects also maximised the time that we had in that blockade. Um, you did mention you saw the you saw the tidal range. We had four named storms during that blockade, which meant that we lost 17 days of production in effect. Um, but the arrangement that we had on site, uh, the team that we had on site, just diverted activities to other things. So we didn't actually we 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 lost program time, but overall 
we kept a schedule we, we we opened when we said we would which was a big thing for the transport for wales and network rail really reputationally because um we shut this quite a few times and uh you know they were at great pains that's why you saw the weeks on there when we went to do the uh, the liaison with everybody we had to convert a lot of the videos to show why we needed the time we needed because it's quite easy to show an animation and people say well why can't you do that in two days so you can't 40,000 person hours worked on there and not one accident. That's the big thing that I'm proud of. And we're proud as the team. There wasn't one accident during that works, which is which is fantastic. I could go on and tell you how many rock anchors, precast concrete. I, 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 I jotted it all down being a project manager, you do these sort of things. Um, but ultimately uh, we opened on time and, and it was done, you know, it was done safely. So thanks very much. I think we're about now if you want to ask any questions. Do we have a question in the room first while we see who's who's left anything online? Yeah. I've got a question. So I, it was obviously um uh 1800s bridge. Uh, so it's and all so it's all imperial measurements and things. You've you've referred to several dimensions very accurately in millimeters. Were there any issues regarding the translation of imperial to metric tolerance in dimensions? No, no not really. I mean, the, the, I suppose the, the, the one advantage that we have is that the, the superstructure is, is all brand new. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the bearing positions, we didn't put them exactly the same as, as they were on there. So we have improved it ever so slightly. There's an offset from track to bridge originally. Uh, not major, but there is a, there is an offset there, so we've actually adjusted that slightly so that it's it's a much more centralised uh, thing in terms of that. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, other than that, the only the only other I suppose aspect of it there was the piers one and two, the cowling at the top of the piers one and two, which is purely decorative, uh, was in such a poor state that we had to, had to take that down for fear that it would fall down, and uh, we've put new ones up. Uh, since then, uh, and that was interesting in terms of in terms of the dimensions that they were, because they were uh, all sorts of different dimensions, generally based on six foot, but not quite. Yeah. Quite interesting because some of the Georgian records don't exist of the intermediate build from the original build, mm -hmm. and uh, we were approached during the build by um, podcasters who were much more um, au fait with the history of the structure telling us or telling me things that I didn't know that they'd gone into the archives Conobias and uh, archives and things and, and and found that there was no I don't think there was any visual records of the Georgian rebuild but there was records of the original build so it's quite interesting now that they've got a full suite of records <laughs> and a brand new bridge that they can refer to in metric so yeah it's um it's a very interesting place to work Barmouth because it's held in such high esteem in the in the community that uh, everybody's got a story to. We were working on a structure uh, some way up the estuary and some chap came to site and said they had showed me a photograph of his father who was one of the last team of people to ever, ever winch the bridge open. They took great pains to tell me all about that, which is really nice. Yeah. So, yeah. So what was the condition of the piers, the metal piers in the sort of tidal zone? The, the, the piers themselves are actually in relatively good condition. Um, the first piers one and two were cast, the rest of them were wrought. Um, in terms of overall thickness, the, you, you've got a good inch plus because we had to drill through them for various fixings and such like. The bracing that's in between the piers in the, in the tidal zone, exceptionally poor. Uh, lots of holes uh, in, the, in the main beams, all the rest of it. The, the the bottom the, the we actually left in the uh, the lower horizontal beams because they're in remarkably good condition largely because they don't come out the water very often so therefore the oxygen doesn't get to them and so on and so forth um, the concrete inside of the piece um, at, at times it was a little bit of honeycombing in, in I remember we drilled through one of the one of the uh, lower ones on I think uh, P4 uh, and we just had water coming out of it for a, a reasonable length of time. Um, fresh water, I'm reliably informed. Um, but a lot of the work that we did, we, we tested the concrete from a bearing position uh, point of view from the, the top uh, and it passed that admirably. Um, the drilling and the, the fixing of things, both from a temporary arrangement and the permanent arrangement, we tested 
almost everything that we put into the uh, into the concrete, um, up to I think 66 kilonewtons as a, as a pullout force as the, as the as the most that I can recall, uh, and no problems at all. Uh, literally, not a single problem with the concrete. And you know, when you think that one and two are the original piers from 1867. Uh, Remarkable, to be honest with you. I mean, what I would say about one and two is if you ever look at it, there's an awful lot of strapping to one and two uh, that was there before we started, and we put a couple on whilst we were doing the work as well, because uh, there's a lot of cracks in it. But actually, um, structurally, they are, they are pretty sound, to be honest with you. And how, how deep down do the piers go into the riverbed? So, yeah. So, one and two, um, it's, I'm not going to guess because I can't remember exactly, but it goes down to Rockhead. Which is quite good, which is probably why they're in such condition. The other ones, genuinely, we don't know. Um, but so we know that they're on uh, green piles eventually. Um, so timber piles somewhere, somewhere down below them. Uh, they don't reach rock because we've done some boreholes down there, and the, we we couldn't reach rock. So we're pretty confident that they probably don't reach rock, which is one of the concerns that they had, especially on Pier Four. And you've got a very slender pier; it's relatively tall in terms of what it is. Um, Tony G, who were with the designers both for permanent and for the majority of the temporary works, were concerned that if you just left that to its own devices, that you might have you might have an issue with it. And I know that from doing the timber works, that we have had or there has been issues in the past with simply the timber piles, and they tend not to be very tall at all, whereas these are much bigger in terms of that. So there was a genuine concern over that. So the actual depth, not certain, which is one of the reasons why we wanted to maintain. That kind of pull frame arrangement. Thanks. Any questions online? Yeah, we've got a couple online. Um, is Christian Thomas there? Um, would you like to come off mute and ask your question? <laughs> okay. Uh, he'd uh, <laughs> asked. Uh, in that case, he'd asked. I understand the core works were undertaken throughout a thirteen-week blockade. But to gain track access prior to and after core works, were there any specific constraints or anything needed to be done differently while maintaining passenger experience? Um, so we, we used rules of the route, possessions, standard possessions uh, on the run up to it. So uh, there was an awful lot of prep work to the actual structures itself um, in terms of uh, putting the lifting brackets on, putting temporary beams in underneath, uh, concreting sections of pier three. All of that work was done in advance of the main block, simply using uh, rules of the route possessions. Um, so nothing particular. I mean, the, the whole the whole ethos of the scheme, both the timber one and the metallic one, was to minimise disruption as much as we could, which is why we the blockade was when it was. Um, and yeah, we just used, like I say, normal normal rules of the route for the uh, for the approach works. We were co-opted onto the Cambrian Rail. I forget the title, Cambrian Rail mm -hmm. Working Group. Um, we presented every period, more or less, to them on what our requirements are. There was even a, a, some discussion about putting a temporary, temporary uh, station in Barmouth and uh, running right the way down to where we were working and deconfliction. So there was a lot, a lot of stakeholder management that we had to do because obviously there's been so much disruption on that line. So not to alienate the passengers too much. So, yeah, that, that, that took some time. But as Steve said, predominantly all of the pre-works were done under rules of the route. Any others online? Um, Ruth Thomas had asked if the video is public, publicly available. And Gareth Yates, who I wonder might be in part of your team. Yes, yeah, yeah. 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 that already and yeah. has put a posted link to Twitter, uh, Twitter link. So, uh, yeah. yeah, it runs a lot quicker and... Uh, it does run a lot it's a lot smoother than that okay yeah, it is a lot smoother than that. there's, a, there's a, a good video on linkedin from Everell mom which actually covers all three both refurbishments so you've got the timber mm -hmm. and the metallic kind of mixed together in that it's also the use of the animation just to add to that the animation was absolutely it was money well spent in being able to liaise with um you know, third parties and the public, because we did a lot of public consultation. So they actually understood what we were trying to achieve and the duration. People love this sort of, you know, there are a whole series on TV dedicated to this sort of things. People, we're hoping that they enjoy the engineering. We're hoping for a Netflix series. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we are up in the background. <laughs> we held a community drop in event in, in June. Um, so we sat out on the harbour sides, had a 
big uh, gazebo, network grill gazebo. Yeah, we were showing members of the public the animation. We had about 350 people pass through during during that day alone. So yeah, a lot of really keen interest in the scheme. And mm. we had a lot of keen interest from network rail and people wanted to come to site, but just because of the nature, you can understand we couldn't get people to site. So we set up a viewing platform. We held a week of uh, uh, diarised timetable drop-ins so people could see and we had that on the laptop so mm. you know we didn't have people trying to crawl underneath and through the structure whilst we were trying to cut it up <laughs> last question gary okay. um yeah grade two listed structure and you're replacing the superstructure including yeah. including fake rivets yes um it's a bit of a triggers broom question there isn't there when you replace the structure how much of it's you know, <laughs> did, what, how, what was the planning and consent process like for this grade two star? Yes, the so same as Westminster, yes, houses yes. of Westminster. So the planning, sorry, I'm no, sure the question you carry. Long, long, long process with the consent. Um, this is building consent has to be submitted. Outline design, wasn't it? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, involved sort of regular stakeholder meetings with CADU um, and our, um, our planning team, um, our town planning team. Yeah, any sort of minor changes with the of the design yeah. that we then had to go through the same process. Um, so yeah, are they the ones yeah. pushing for a, you know, a visual like for like? Yes, I mean, it, yeah, it, it, it was never a question to be honest. I mean, it was always going to be. I mean, down to the detail of fake rivets. Well, the, the fake rivets did come from um, from the local authority. That, that was their request. Uh, it was interesting because, as you can imagine, the vast majority was on site like. Yeah, and, and it was a bit of a headache in terms of how we were going to get these things on not affect the fatigue issue yeah. of welding all of these not things all off the top make sure not three thousand uh yeah we, we <laughs> went through we went through lots of iterations in the end the uh they plug welded on right. basically so you've just got a hollow basically a donut that's, that's welded on what i will say is the first time that i went to see the bridge um a trial erection uh i very much understood that it was definitely the thing to do right. it would have looked so wrong had we not done it. Uh, so, you know, I have to concede the point that it was a really, really good idea, to be honest with you. And, and again, you know, the change of the handrail, uh, officially, you know, the list building, um, you know, the, the listed states of it means that the handrailing, which was, is actually basically, it's highway handrailing that was on it, that was put in on, on the 80s, when they did it up on the 80s, which looks awful. Um, so there was a lot of uh, research done in terms of what it used to look like, in terms of that, and when that came back, Local authority in Cadu and basically said, so this is what we want to do. It was part funded by uh, Railway Heritage uh, and it really just set it off. Um, if, if you've been lucky enough to be going across the bridge previously and then walk across it now, and we get a lot of public stopping us because we're still there just finishing off and getting scaffolding away and finishing off some painting, get an awful lot of the public uh, stopping us and, and saying how fantastic it looks, what a, what a, what a difference it makes, uh, what a good job we've done, so on and so forth. And the, the hand railing, really does make a difference and that was a that was quite a big change when you consider the the, the view of the bridge and how it looks Even the swing mechanism furniture has been replaced it doesn't work but it's been replaced. oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. The time authorities for the navigation light is, is, it, is are you saying the original has been put back or yes right. yeah yeah so yeah, so it, yeah. yeah. painted put no, back so. but it doesn't yeah. it won't yeah. stop anyone trying to use it i'm sure yeah yeah, yeah. Right, we're going to have to wrap up. I think we've uh, probably all got other places mm -hmm. we should be getting to. So, uh, quick final round of applause, if you could. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The thing that stood out to me is you can tell that oh, the whole project team probably lived and breathed this for so long. I mean, the, the level of detail in there and the way you talk about it without referring to notes. Um, yeah, that, I, that's kind of properly logged in there now, isn't it? I, 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 I have personally been involved in working on the structure for over six years. Yeah. Uh, like I said, the, the rivets change uh, was one of the first times I was involved in that, and that was definitely six years ago, or more than six years ago, I suspect. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah it, fair to say we have lived and breathed yeah. it. Fantastic. Yeah. Credit to the rest of the team. We're only a very oh, yeah, small yeah, yeah. part of the team that's yeah. right there. You know, forty thousand hours is quite some period of time. Just that's only the metallic element as well. We haven't incorporated the timber element in that. Yes. Yeah. So, so th this was, a, you know, a fairly heavily civils biased presentation, and I think um, that does reflect the journey we're taking as an institution now. You know, from what was pretty much just track engineering, I guess, 
through into what, what we are now is a, a rail infrastructure engineering. So we, we try and cover all disciplines um, in varying levels of detail. So that was really interesting and I guess a little bit different for some of us who don't get involved in civils that often. So um, thanks again and yep. we'll see you in four weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.